I've been asked to basically open up this, this program on mind and its potential. Uh, up to this moment of sitting here, I haven't got a clue what I'm going to talk about. But um, mind and its potential is such an important subject that I'm sure something will come to my mind. <laughs> Buddhism, of course, has always put mind at the forefront, recognizing, as Tony said, that essentially our suffering and our happiness depends on the mind that we so often blame external circumstances, other people, the economic situation, the government, the world, samsara, for our problems. But if we really examine, the real problem lies within. And of course, this is really good news, because while we can change ourselves, it's very hard to change the rest of the world. So, in all uh, Buddhist schools, it has been understood that the main problem for us, as I'm sure so many of you already know, I'm not saying anything new here, are the afflictive or negative emotions that lie within our mind stream. That is, our greed and grasping. Our attachment is a big problem for us because it, it makes us grasp and cling and, and feel loss. We tend to solidify everything and want things to stay how they are, people to stay how they are, everything to stay, if it is pleasant for us at least, that it, it will remain forever. And, of course, uh, everything is changing, everything is impermanent. So the very fact of our clinging creates uh, stress. Because in our hearts, we know we cannot hold on forever. So it's not the objects, it's not the, the, the relationships, it's not the possessions. It, that is not the problem. The problem is always our, our attachment and grasping at these things, which causes the problems. So the first of our afflictive emotions is our greed and grasping. And then, of course, a big one, anger, irritation, frustration, hatred, resentment. It disturbs the mind. An angry mind is not a happy mind. An angry mind is not a peaceful mind. And some people carry on their resentments all their lives. A while back, I got a letter from a woman who had... <coughs> sorry. I mean, she wrote six pages <coughs> on how she, some uh, crooked lawyer had deprived her of her home. And she was going on and on about it, and you know, how upset she was about this. And then it turned out that this had all happened 30 years ago. And, and she was still holding on. So really, in so many ways, we are our own worst enemies. You know, the lawyer had gone on probably to a new rebirth. But uh, she was still holding on to this, this, this um, injustice as if it had happened the day before. So uh, all of these emotions are called klesha, they're called afflictive, because they hurt us. They cause us pain. Then there is uh, jealousy and envy. People get something and... Uh, instead of, of being happy for their good fortune, we, we feel upset and angry and wish that it had happened to us instead of to them. And, and pride, arrogance, in the sense of, you know, thinking ourselves um, very superior and special. This also causes a lot of pain, 
because especially if people don't think we're so special, we get very upset. But the root of it all, the root of all this cycle of endless negative thinking is the ignorance. And ignorance in, in Buddhist context does not, of course, mean, you know, not knowing what is the capital of Patagonia or, you know, knowing about quantum physics. It is the lack of understanding the true nature of how things really are, not only uh, our appearing outer reality, but in particular, our, our false identification with our true nature. Because this is the very root of the problem. The root of the problem is that we identify with all the wrong things that we identify with our thinking conceptual mind and we don't realize our true nature. This is why we're talking about mind and its potential because the mind is not just the thinking mind, our, our conceptual mind. Um, the brain, I mean, many people, uh, some of the talkers are going to be speaking about the plasticity of the brain, and I think we have some neuroscientists. And of course, the brain is absolutely fascinating and, and has been very helpful in showing people that we can change, that we're not already neurally wired to be the way we are. Actually, we, we can transform our, our, our thinking minds and learn new habits. If we have bad habits, we can, you know, discipline ourselves to learn new habits. So this is wonderful. But we are more than just our brain. Our thinking mind is very useful, essential. It's not that we're trying not to think. There's nothing wrong with having thoughts. The problem is only when we identify with those thoughts. When we think, this is me, this is mine. And we do identify with our thoughts. We identify with our sense of gender, race, nationality, profession, our memories of our childhood, adolescence, and so on, what we did yesterday, what we did this morning, our opinions, judgments, beliefs. This is what makes me, me. And so, from the perspective of Dharma, this is our essential unknowing. This is our essential ignorance. In, in Sanskrit, it's avidya, which means exactly that, unknowing. We don't know who we really are. It's, I mean, without solidifying this, it's like an actor who is playing a role and while they are playing the role, uh, you know, he absolutely identifies with his role. I mean, if it's a good actor, he becomes the, the character he's playing. But if when he goes off stage, he still thinks he's Hamlet, he has a problem. And so this is the point, that yes, we play our role, and we play it the best we can, because this is the role we're given to play in this lifetime, but essentially we know we are not that. And so it's very important to always remember that behind all the coming and going of this conceptual mind, 
We have Buddha nature. It's very important to remember that at the, the essential nature of our mind is wisdom and compassion, is an empty, luminous clarity. That's our true nature. All this other phenomena which appears in our mind is, it's rather like, you know, all right, if the brain is a computer, then it's, it's what is the energy driving that computer? We have to go back and look at the electric current behind this, uh, the computer programming. Because without that, there would be no computer. It won't work. And so our, our primordial awareness, which is behind the coming and going of our, our thinking mind, is, is, is like the sky, the vast blueness of the sky, which normally is, is covered by thick clouds. And so unlike today when we can see the luminous blue sky, normally our mind is covered by very thick clouds. They might be white clouds, they might be black clouds, but they're just clouds. But like the Indian monsoon, you know, it goes on forever and ever and you just never see the sky. And we forget that there is a sky. We are just fascinated by the clouds. And that's who we identify with. So ultimately, we are the vast, endless sky. Sometimes the idea of a sky is better than the idea of Buddha nature, insofar as otherwise we tend to think each one has a little Buddha nature. And my Buddha nature is more pristine than your Buddha nature. <laughs> so it, it's very important to remember that it's not like little Buddhas sitting inside us that it's something vast, in that, that level of primordial awareness, there, the one thing about it is that it's non-dualistic. Our ordinary conceptual thinking always has a subject and an object. It's dualistic. But in the nature of the mind, it, it transcends that dualistic split. And so there is a tremendous sense of interconnection not only with all humans, but with all beings and with all nature. There, there is that recognition that there, there are no boundaries, that actually we all partake together of, of this primordial consciousness, which is our nature. It's not something vast and far away, it's, it's who we are. The very fact that you can hear me and see me and think about that is because we are conscious. But normally we're thinking so hard that we're not even conscious of being conscious. We're not aware of being aware. So it's really so close to us that they say it's like the eyes cannot see themselves because they're too close. So we, our awareness is, is our is our true nature, so it's very hard for us to actually see it without interfering with conceptual thinking again. But it, it's, it's there, it's who we are. In the meantime, we are stuck with also our, our conceptual thinking, and I'm supposed to be telling you how to lighten your day by dealing with um, the various negative emotions which trouble us. I, I think it's very important, as the Buddha himself always emphasized, to really, in our very stressful daily lives where we are all so busy, you have families, you have you know, professions, you have a social life, really it's very important to cultivate the quality of, as much as possible, being centered and, and being aware which just means that while we are doing something, we know we're doing it. And not doing one thing and thinking a thousand other things at the same time, 
which also makes us very inefficient. Nowadays, there is a lot of stress on efficiency. Well, the most efficient thing to do is to settle the mind where the body is. And therefore, to have a certain clarity there with when we are doing something, like now you are sitting, just to know you are sitting. And if you are listening and not sleeping, then to know that you're listening. It's very simple. Actually, our lives have become so complicated, it's very important to simplify and not to make our Dharma practice into something even more complicated, an extra thing on top of all the other stuff we've got to do. The, the Dharma should be lightening our lives, making it flow more spontaneously, not adding extra you know, rocks to the, the backpack that people are carrying through their lives. Should be throwing out the rocks, lightening things up, opening things up. So, it is agreed throughout all traditions that we need to become more conscious of our mind. What is going on there? So that when negative emotions arise, greed, anger, pride, jealousy, we know it. Actually, the, 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 really the quickest way to deal with our negative emotions, which cause us so much pain, they cause so much pain to ourselves and they cause so much pain to others. The quickest way apart from applying antidotes, the quickest way is just to know it. Right, right now I'm feeling angry. Anger has arisen. And then to decide what to do. Either we can feed it, we can apply an antidote such as patience, or we can just let it go. It's important not to make a whole big scenario out of our negative emotions. To, you know, if we get upset, to then blame ourselves for being upset. And, and therefore just turn the anger outside, back inside again. That doesn't help anything and it doesn't simplify the situation, it just creates another spiral. So what we need is to, is to become aware and aware of our intentions. It's so simple, really. Our thoughts very much influence, I mean, they totally influence our speech and our actions. So therefore, we need to catch things right at the beginning. Where before we speak, before we act, what is the genuine intention? And if the intention, if we are honest, if the intention is mixed with anger, irritation, or, or with greed, or desires, negative desires, or with envy, or any of these other ego inflation, etc., we can catch it and say, no, that's negative intention. Negative intentions lead to negative speech and negative actions. It's very simple. The problem is normally that we are just carried away by the stream of our thinking and we act and speak before we're even conscious of why we're doing it. So, therefore, this ability to stand back and, and, and see what is actually going on before we precipitate ourselves in, into um, verbal and physical actions. And therefore, to try to keep our intention kind. 
It would be a very different world as we know if only people were more kind. His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness. And kindness transcends any religious or traditional or any kind of separation. Kindness means the desire for the happiness of others. To recognize that merely being focused on our own happiness will probably leave us feeling very frustrated and dissatisfied. People spend so much time trying to make themselves feel happy, as you know. I mean, we, we're buying endless things which we don't really need, and, and it's absorption and obsession in food and, you know, eating the right things and not eating the wrong things and all of these things and, uh, you know, how to keep our bodies in good condition and our houses looking beautiful and our cars upmarket. And everybody tries so hard. It's like, you know, on, on a road and on a, a treadmill. Getting nowhere at the end. But if we spend our time, our days, genuinely recognizing that every being that we meet wants to be happy, doesn't want to be unhappy, it even doesn't matter how difficult they are, how indifferent they are, how rude they are, anything. In their heart of hearts, they would like to feel okay and they, they don't want to feel sad. And if we recall that, that just as we want happiness and not suffering, so all beings want happiness and not suffering, then we can extend that to them, the wish for their well-being. And then we go through life, meeting people after people after people, our families, very important to make our families happy and extend our kindness to our family, our colleagues, our friends and social associates, anyone that we meet. The first impulse, unspoken but felt, is may you be happy. So then we would spend all day just thinking about the happiness of others. It's not difficult. I mean, it's very sad that we human beings who pride ourselves so much on our intellect, how clever we are, so much superior to all the other beings on this planet. And we have such potential because ultimately we're all Buddhas. So then why is it that we end up being so nasty? Why is it that we cause so many problems? to ourselves, and to others, and to the planet. And the reason is because of we are habituated to entertaining these very negative emotions within us. Now these emotions, the good news is, the, these emotions are in, in Buddhist parlance called afflictive emotions. These afflictive emotions are called adventitious. Adventitious means that they are not innate. Innate is our wisdom and compassion. These adventitious defilements just come, but they, don't, they are not permanent. They are not part of who we really are. And because of that, they can be transformed. They can be uprooted. They can be seen through into their essential empty nature. It's not that by nature we are sinful, by nature we are perfect, but we got lost. And just as now we are habituated to sometimes cultivating very negative states of mind, which harm ourselves and harm others, likewise we can transform these negative states of mind into positive states of mind. For example, 
if we have people who we know who, who upset us and irritate us, then we can recognize that these people are, are actually very helpful for us. This is a very important point that in order to cultivate certain qualities, we need the, to deal with the opposite. So, for example, in order to transform our anger and irritation into forbearance and patience, which is a very strong and powerful uh, kind of mind. I mean, people think, oh, if we're patient, we're weak. But actually, it's people who get am upset and angry and irritated when something opposes them. They're the weak ones. I mean, all these action heroes are wimps. <laughs> they only know how to return aggression with aggression. That's not being strong. Being strong is to take that aggression and transform it, our, our, our reaction to it, into something very powerful. So therefore, when we have to deal with somebody who is very irritating or upsetting to us, instead of becoming upset and irritated, we can recognize that this, this person or circumstance is actually a helper for us on the path. Because without someone to annoy us, how can we learn to be patient? <laughs> well, think about it. You know, if we are also always surrounded by people who are friendly and nice, then of course we are friendly and nice back, and that's lovely. But we don't learn anything from that. It's easy to be loving to someone who is lovable. The point is to, to also develop that quality of friendliness and, and, and patience towards someone who's obnoxious. So therefore, if we meet someone who is very difficult, instead of getting upset with them and seeing them as an obstacle to my being a spiritual person, <laughs> we, we say, in our heart at least, Thank you so much for being so horrible. <laughs> you are going to really help me with my, 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 my practice because patience and forbearance is one of the very important qualities needed on the Bodhisattva path to Buddhahood. And without someone like you, who is so awful, how could I learn? So, I mean, in the sutras they say you place this person on your head like your teacher. And, and, but the important thing is to, to feel, this is my practice, thank you. And, and to feel a kind of gratitude towards them for being difficult. And in this way, we, we become strong. And also we, we rise beyond hope and fear. Because we recognize that even the difficult circumstances in our life what can we learn? You know, they are teaching us something much more than the easy circumstances. Um, I, I, maybe when I was one time in India, bef after I had left um, uh, the, the Himalayas, uh, I was in South India and we went to see this astrologer. And uh, so my, my friend actually was visiting him, but I thought, why wow, we're there. So I said to him, okay, I have two choices now. Either I can go back into retreat, or I can start a nunnery. What, what do you think? So he looked, and then he said, well, if you go back into retreat, very peaceful, very happy, very, very uh, conducive. If you start the nunnery, many problems, many difficulties, many challenges. But both are good, so you decide. <laughs> so then, of course, I thought, right, back into retreat. But then I, I spoke with this uh, Catholic priest 
And he said, well, of course you start the nunnery. He said, we are like pieces of rough wood. And if we are always stroking ourselves with silk and velvet, that is very nice. But we don't get smooth. To get smooth, we need sandpaper. So, all those difficult people and difficulties in the life that we meet with are our sandpaper, making us smooth and shiny. This is very important. Of course, this does not mean that when we're in very abusive situations, we should just, you know, lie down and say, kick me harder. It doesn't mean that. If, if one is in a very abusive situation, or if people are cheating you, or, you know, of course one can be strong and stand up against that, and, and deal with that in a very powerful way. I mean, I think it's very important to remember that while the bodhisattva of compassion is uh, Chenrezig, who is uh, shown as being white and smiling and radiating lights and looking very peaceful and just how a bodhisattva of compassion should look, nonetheless, the other aspect of this same bodhisattva of compassion is Mahakala. And Mahakala, the great black one, is the chief of all the protectors in Tibetan Buddhism and is shown as black and extremely warful <laughs> and designed to terrify because sometimes, uh, you know, evil forces or difficulties cannot be overcome just by peaceful means. Sometimes one has to show very wrathful means, but still the energy behind it is not anger, but compassion. You know, sometimes, as with small children, you cannot always just say, no, darling, don't do that. You know, don't put your hand on this burning pot. You, you have to be very uh, forceful with them. I guess in Australia, you're not allowed to smack them anymore. You get arrested, but... <laughs> we have to recognize we are in this world in order to learn. We are in this world in order to grow up and become mature human beings, and eventually to realize the mind's potential, which is Buddhahood. And so, apart from times of um, strict retreat, the rest of the time you have your lives. Your lives are your Dharma practice. It's very important to recognize that your lives are not an obstacle to your practice. They are the practice. Learning how to cultivate qualities like generosity, ethics, patience, enthusiasm, the equality to be present in the moment and really understand what the mind is thinking and to uproot and transform the negative and to cultivate and encourage the positive, to really do everything for the sake of other beings, that all beings are on this journey with us. This is really very essential. Our family, our work colleagues, our friends, our whole life is our Dharma practice. Because everything is lived through the mind. And whether we are in strict retreat or whether we are in the center of our family or at our workplace, we take our mind with us. And how we cultivate the mind is the essential point. No one can do it for us. Even if the Buddha himself was here, all he could say is, practice. As they say, practice makes perfect. So moment to moment to moment, we practice. 
We practice really knowing what is in the mind and transforming the negative into the positive and opening our heart to embrace all beings in kindness, in compassion, loving kindness, and using all events to transform our minds and our lives into something worthwhile so that at the time of death and we're all going to die, we can look back and think, well, I used this life meaningfully. I didn't waste it. I used it to benefit myself and to benefit others. This was a worthwhile life, and now I'm ready to go. So all of you, please, I, I, from my heart, cultivate the, the conceptual thinking mind, open up the heart, but always remember that essentially we do have Buddha nature. It's calling to us the whole time. Every time we have an impulse of compassion, of kindness, of thinking of others beyond ourselves, that's our Buddha nature calling to us reminding us of who we really are and that right now we are just playing a role. Maybe we play that role successfully or sometimes it's a problem, but it's just a role we're playing. It's not our true nature. So please, during this, this conference now, you will listen to many wise voices and I hope that you will gain some really good ideas and hints which we carry away with us. In the Buddha Dharma, we have to study and think about things, but then we have to become it. We have to put it into practice. So, wonderful. This marvelous conference is now about to start, and I wish you all that you may be very well and happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the time we're 60, more than 90% of us will have known someone close to us who has suffered from some sort of a neurological disorder. You all know you're not going to live forever. There's only one way into this life and one way out. I cannot prove to you anymore that anything is possible. Talk about the marvelous thing that we now understand about our brains. It gets so much better.